everyone and welcome to the new episode of the All Atlantic Talks podcast, an initiative supported by the European Commission with an anchor CSA and with the aim of strengthening the visibility of the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance. This is the episode number 10 with a very important topic, All Atlantic Marine Biotechnology Initiative. And in order to analyze, in order to discuss about this topic, we have two guests today with us, Dr. Fabiano Thompson, oceanographer and professor of marine biology of the Institute of Biology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and coordinator of the Biotechmar Initiative here in Brazil. Welcome, Dr. Thompson. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you very much for being with us. And we have also Dr. Dorinde Klengris, senior researcher at the North Norwegian Research Center in Norway. Welcome, Dr. Klengris. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for being with us. Starting with the first question of our podcast, starting with Dr. Thompson. Your perspective, Dr on how can marine biodiversity and marine biotechnologies foster the development of new and emerging technologies and which are the benefits for our societies and for sustainable development. Please, Doctor, the floor is yours. Well, thanks again for the organizing this meeting. Also, thank you, Doreen, for joining us from Norway. In many ways, the ocean is still uh, has many secrets. Let's come to the bottom line. We have to seek uh, food security for our countries. The ocean is a source of food items and new molecules that can be harnessed in the different biotechnological uh, processes. When we talk about marine biodiversity, it goes beyond whales, turtles, and uh, all these very symbolic organisms. The majority of the biodiversity is hidden within the microbes which inhabit this planet for the last 4 billion years. By the way, they produce the oxygen we breathe. And um, all these microbes, then they can be harnessed in biotechnological processes through biotechnological tools such as culturomics, omics, metabolomics, and uh, new molecules can be found in these microbes that can be used in uh, uh, aquaculture processes, the pharmaceutical industry, in the food industry. In terms of uh, systems, particularly those systems that uh, have few huge and tapped biodiversity, such as the reef systems, they deserve our attention for the present and for the future generations. Why? Because they, they are the habitats for huge biodiversity in the ocean. They serve as nursery place for different types of marine life, from microbes to sharks, whales. Despite that, these reefs, they are under threat due to some uh, industry giants that explore the ocean. So we have to seek uh, new ways to explore the ocean and study the ocean towards a lower carbon economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. I would like to ask the same question to Dr. Dorinda Klengris. Dr. Klengris, so under your perspective, how can marine biodiversity and marine biotechnologies foster the development of a new and emerging technologies and which are the benefits for our societies and for sustainable development. Please, doctor. Thank you. It's a very interesting question and I fully agree with Professor Thompson. There's a lot to make use of in the, in the oceans and I, I would say the possibilities are almost endless as far as we can, uh, we can think with creativity wise. But I'd like to highlight uh, some concrete examples that, that we are, for example, at NORS are working on especially coming from a Nordic perspective. One of the good things and one of the nice things about biodiversity is that all these organisms, they live at, at all different places. For example, here in Norway, uh, there are some very cold seas. And that makes that the organisms living there, they have evolved to survive these specific habitats. And that has then different, given them some very specific characteristics to also survive these conditions and perform still well. And it's especially those characteristics that, uh, that sometimes make them very interesting also for uh, industrial applications. So my background research is, is, is microalgae. 
there's estimated many, many hundreds of thousands of different species that there exist in the world everywhere where there's water. But if we look at commercial algae production, then actually only a very limited amount of all species is currently being used. But that is definitely changing already. There is more and more products with microalgae ingredients coming on the market, but still there is so much more possible, I think. And that really, the products, for example, that could be derived from these organisms range from medical applications like painkillers to food and feed ingredients to all the way to, to more bulk products like materials and, uh, and even biofuels. Having said that, not everything is especially currently already feasible, especially not economically. So that's also where then biotechnology would start playing a role. But finding new strains, optimizing strains especially, as well as optimizing production processes can then help to make all these, these potentials become reality. So that's also, for example, if we look from a Nordic perspective, so there's a, we have been bioprospecting microalgae in, uh, in the cold waters around uh, Norway with the idea that, or the hypothesis that in cold waters will probably find species that have lipids with more unsaturated fatty acids to be able to survive this cold, and hopefully species does with a higher omega-3 fatty acid content. And indeed, we have found some, uh, some very interesting strains, some very high in omega-3 fatty acids, but not always capable of growing under industrial conditions, not very robust. Others were lower, for example, or slightly lower in, in omega-3 fatty acid content, but were very robust. So optimizing these strains, taking them further to get them to higher productivities at an industrial level would be the next step. But it's not just one strain that you could look at or and optimizing this one strain. When we talk about biodiversity, what we see is also that there's a huge biodiversity already in culture of one algae, but that there's always uh, other bacteria there, for example. And what we generally, what is said is that having a higher biodiversity, so having multiple uh, microorganisms next to the algae in our reactors will also make that culture more robust. But this is also something where we still lack a lot of information. We don't know really who interacts with whom, how they interact. Are they friends? Are they foes? We know, for example, in agricultural crops that pests and pathogens can lead to around 20 to 30 percent of annual losses. And it's really expected that in microalgae cultivation, this is at least a similar, if not more. So to be able to, for example, develop pest control strategies or improve biomass productivity or quality, we need also to get a better understanding of uh, this microbiome and, and everything that's, that's living, so to say, in our photobioreactors. But then next to microalgae, they're really very interesting, but there's many other interesting things as well that we can get from the ocean. Another example, for example, would be enzymes. Also there, specific conditions make that you can find specific interesting enzymes. For example, companies are looking at, um, at heat label enzymes that are very, can, for example, that their, their activity can be stopped very easily by just a, a minor temperature increase. And those enzymes can uh, come from uh, fault uh, marine environments. And this is very interesting because then we could use a, a very small temperature increase to already stop the activity of those enzymes. And, and with that small temperature increase, you would not necessarily then influence the overall quality of, uh, of the product. Concluding, in my opinion, biodiversity is great and we should really be making use of that and then combine that with, of course, biotechnological approaches to, uh, to further improve the process or the product. And with that, we can then definitely help um, society uh, with more products, with more sustainable processes. So that will, uh, will benefit everybody, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Klenning. So I would like to Klenning Gris, I would like to continue with you about talking about this topic. And I would like to ask, um, because you mentioned it quickly, micro algae, the circular bioeconomy. Could we go more in deep in there? Yeah, one of the things that we see a lot of interest in in companies around us, for example, is that more and more companies have waste streams that they are interested in, in using instead of let them actually go to waste. And one big example there could be aquaculture. Depending on how the fish are being produced, that can be on land, that can be in sea. But in both cases, more and more companies are looking into capturing the waste coming from these systems and, and not just spill that out into the ocean. One, because spilling it out to the ocean provides waste to the ocean, which might not be so nice. But the other thing is you're losing a lot of interesting resources. You're, there, there's a lot of nitrogen phosphate being lost if they would just be released to sea, whereas it could be really interesting to actually make use of these as, uh, as nutrients. So that's one thing that where microalgae could, for example, play a role because they're very good in 
taking up nutrients from water. So that's one of the things we are studying and how can we do that? How can we integrate that? But also when we're thinking about waste streams, generally these are slightly more complex than just the regular growth media. So how does this influence productivity? How does this influence the microbiome in a culture? Are all topics that, that we try to address with our research, but that I think can uh, in the end work out really well or be a part of, of a circular bioeconomy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kleinis. So, Dr. Thompson, the second question, if you can give us some examples of relevant initiatives in this context and uh, highlight international cooperation perspectives in the whole Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance. Please, Doctor, the floor is yours. Within the All Atlantic Anchor project, we had uh, the chance to develop a network of uh, researchers and uh, entrepreneurs across all the Atlantic to foster marine biotechnology. This was uh, possible through a joint uh, pilot action called uh, Biotechmar Joint Action, developed uh, in the last uh, year and a half, a number of uh, networking meetings, workshops, seminars, presentations also. The last one was in uh, Washington, D.C., in the occasion of the declaration of uh, research for the All-Atlantic Research. And this is so important. Why? We know too well research is developed locally, but research is an international endeavor. It's an international initiative. Researchers benefit from each other when they interact, uh, researchers from different countries. In the case of our joint action, there were around 20 countries uh, participating, uh, including Norway and uh, several other countries from Europe, Canada, the United States, several countries from Latin America and uh, from Africa. We have learned some lessons from these uh, meetings and uh, seminars, workshops. Some were more showcases of what was going on in different uh, laboratories in different countries. The others were more towards teaching of uh, bioinformatics uh, tools and uh, biotechnology tools. There were many aspects that uh, deserve mention. First, we uh, notice that um, researchers in developing countries, they are seeking for collaboration. This means scientific collaboration in two directions, exchange of human resources in the two directions, not only receiving researchers and students uh, in, in a country, but also having the opportunity to have researchers travel to other countries across the Atlantic. The other lesson we learned is that uh, marine biotech, by its uh, very nature, is producing many spin-offs, many startups. As marine biotechnology develops, it uh, produces new businesses, businesses that will enter into the bioeconomy, in the blue bioeconomy. And uh, this will help to foster this transition that is badly needed towards a lower carbon economy. The European uh, Commission has delivered guidelines, a document on the Green Deal, and is very ambitious. We here in Brazil and uh, I think in other developing countries, we still need to get to this level of a Green Deal. We have to consider this Green Deal, how marine biotechnology can help to achieve this reduction in carbon emission and uh, improving food security and uh, other aspects. One aspect that is, of course, requires attention from all uh, and also uh, came up from this uh, initiative from uh, Joint Action Biotechmar is the very concept of bioeconomy. Bioeconomy will need to be sustainable. It will be, it will need to be durable. It will certainly need to consider the durability aspects. Otherwise, 
bioeconomy will not be sustainable. For example, in the Amazon, there are a number of uh, biodiversity items, such as uh, the acai or uh, dendê, which are now explored in bioeconomical processes, which is good that because it generates jobs and revenues for the country, on the one hand. On the other hand, these activities imprint a huge footprint, lots of ex uh, negative externalities on the Amazon, such as the deforestation. They, they may imprint these negative externalities. So all the marine bioeconomy activities, will need to consider these examples to avoid the same mistakes. For example, in shrimp aquaculture, many mangroves have been destroyed to create space for shrimp tanks. However, uh, novel technologies based on microbiome, based on microbes, microalgae, they have allowed it almost zero water exchange in this uh, new systems for shrimp and aquaculture, and also low input of food, which puts the, um, the production of shrimp in another level and saves the mangroves from destruction. And uh, this may be similar for other types of uh, uh, agriculture, let's say, in the ocean, because we will use more and more the ocean to produce food and hopefully in a very sustainable way. Another thing we learned finally about uh, the All Atlantic is that uh, we, we need to promote the early uh, career scientists. Those that are uh, at beginning now, their careers, we have to imprint, we have to really foster uh, scientific careers here in Brazil, of course, and in the countries involved, because science is at uh, the base decisions should be taken into account. Even in politics, science should be used to make uh, very assertive and the right decisions. Otherwise, it becomes a matter of very ambiguous, uncertain decisions for the future if we cannot use science as a tool to choose the future of our planet. That's more or less what we have learned. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. Unfortunately, our time is over, but I would like to thank you very much, our guest of today, of this number 10 episode of the All Atlantic Talks podcast, starting with Dr. Fabiano Thompson. Thank you very much, doctor, for being with us today. Thanks for the invitation, Carlo, for everyone my best wishes from the great city of Rio de Janeiro, the wonderful city of Rio de Janeiro. Thank you very much. Really, really nice city, Rio de Janeiro. And also thank you very much to Dr. Dorinda Klesenix, directly from Norway. Thank you very much, doctor. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was really a pleasure. Pleasure was all ours. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to you that are listening us on our podcast. Remember that you can find all the All Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance podcast directly on your streaming platform, on your device, and you can find us also on YouTube. So thank you very much once again for our attention and see you soon on the next episode of the All Atlantic Talks podcast. See you soon. Mm -hmm.